everybody in this church.
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with the true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin.
Son, Jesus, as the heavenly bread of life. Grant us faith to feast on him in your word and sacraments, that we may be nourished unto life everlasting. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for this 10th Sunday after Pentecost is written in the book of Exodus, the 16th chapter. Moses writes, The whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> Thanks be to God. As we begin this month of August, we join now in the Eighth Commandment and its meaning. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. The epistle reading is from St. Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the fourth chapter. St. Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. 
But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Begotten, not made, being 
the one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we join in singing our hymn of the day.
That is probably one of the top ten things that we do here in the United States of America. We know how to spend money. Our homes are filled with that general word that we all use, stuff. It's sad enough that oftentimes when people ask us what we have, it's hard for us to recollect everything other than to tell them we have stuff. When a loved one passes away, when the parents or sometimes the children are left behind, when they have to come and clean out the apartment or the house, you often hear about how much stuff is left behind. Some of us even have rooms dedicated to junk. In fact, some of us even call them that. We all, in a way, have junk rooms. The books, well, at least for me, the toys, the gadgets, all that stuff that we have acquired, and yet it all sits in one little room waiting to be used. Oftentimes you go in after a few years and discover, wow, I just bought a third one of these, forgetting that you had already bought two. Garages that haven't seen a car parked in them in 10 or 15 years. And you don't even have to leave the comfort of your house to go shopping anymore. In fact, if you really wanted to drive your pastor nuts this morning, you could pull out your cell phone and sit there and start shopping on Amazon this very moment. And though we have a greater access to stuff, and we have more of it than we have ever had before. Why do we still grumble and complain so much? Of course, we're not the first ones to have done this. We follow in a long line of the unsatisfied. The Israelites, of course, were one such group. They had spent hundreds of years in Egypt, multiplying and growing in strength and in person. And of course we know that the pharaohs became to become leery of them. So they enslaved them, using them to create the cities for storage and for other great monuments. And even as they are in slavery, the Lord provides them. He provides them with what they needed. He provided them with homes and food. But the suffering of his people continued to grow under the hands of the pharaohs. And they continued to raise their voices to God in need. He heard them, of course. He sends to them Moses and Aaron to bring them out. With the place God showed his authority over the false gods of Egypt. And he brought the Israelites, baptizing them in the Red Sea, drowning hard-hearted Pharaoh and all of his hopes. And henceforth, going out into the wilderness, they were free. They were redeemed looking forward to head to the promised land, the milk, land of milk and honey and wonderfulness as they traveled through the wilderness before them. The Lord had provided for them for all of those years in Egypt. And no doubt he would have continued to provide for them during their short journey through the wilderness. Of course, this is before they get to Israel and decide that they don't want to go in. God had promised to give them all that they needed. 
but and it is a big but the Israelites began to complain and grumble oh we missed it back in Egypt so much Moses we had pots overflowing with meat plenty of vegetables we had roofs over our heads. Well, yeah, we had to deal with cruel taskmasters and, and their whips. And, you know, there was that whole making bricks without straw thing for a while. But what's a little hardship when everything else is being taken care of? If only you had left us back in Egypt, we know that we would have had plenty to eat. It's interesting, though, when you think about this text for a second, that without their grumbling and complaining, would the Lord still have taken care of them? Of course he would. Of course he would have still taken care of them. Even today we know this very thing. As Luther tells us in the first article and elsewhere in the Lord's Prayer as well, that God provides good things even for those people who don't believe in Him. So for us to believe that the only way that the Israelites were going to make it from the Red Sea to the Promised Land and not run out of food unless they grumbled is dumb of us. God would have taken care of them one way or another. It's like for those of you who have had kids, who have kids, who have grandkids, imagine that those children think the only way mom and dad are going to take care of us is if we complain. I think sometimes as kids, do believe that that is the only way you're going to take care of us. Again, remember as well that oftentimes when it comes to complaining, it's because we want it done our own way. We don't want it done your way. I want to be able to eat whatever sugary cereal I darn well please. And the fact that my parents told me that I have to eat oatmeal. Really? And yet they knew what was best. We tend to forget what it means to be truly enslaved to sin, death, and the devil. We forget what it means for them to run our lives, to be driven only by fear of death and the grave, to be pushed along by our selfish desires, to be plagued by the bodies of the evil one. And so then, sin, death, and the devil encourage ourselves to strive only after the bread that lasts for a day or a week maybe a month or sometimes longer but sooner or later usually sooner as you all well know we get distracted again by the longings of our hearts and our minds and our focus is taken off the bread that lasts only be directed back to the things that mock and rust destroy. And then we act like God is holding out on us again. And so then the more that we struggle, the more we wrestle, the more we fail. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe 
in him who he has sent. This is the work of God, he says. Take note of what Jesus doesn't say. He does not say, this is the work of you that you believe in him. Jesus says, this is the work of God. God who is abundant in grace, mercy, and peace, he is the one who works faith in you. The Father is the one who sends the Holy Spirit to bring you to faith and to keep you in that one true faith. And so when you struggle, he struggles with you. When you fall, he's the one who picks you up. When you sin, God forgives you. And he remakes you into his image. He crucifies your old flesh. So that's exactly what baptism is all about. It's about killing and making alive. It's all about joining us to Jesus who is killed on a cross and made alive on the third day. And because you are in Christ, you're a new creation. We don't always feel like it. We deeply struggle. We again give in to our sinful desires. We act like failures. But this isn't who you are. You are in Christ. He has made you a new creation. Hence the Lord's words, I am the bread of life. For when you receive the sacrament, you receive Jesus. You receive his very body and his very blood. He isn't the bread of death. Or the bread of here today and gone tomorrow. He is the bread of life. He gives eternal life. And over and over and over again, because Jesus coming to us is not dependent upon us, but it is upon, dependent upon Him. He can be rich in mercy that lavishes on us the gift of life. Why would you not receive the sacrament of the altar if you knew it gave eternal life? Luther oftentimes questioned the fact that here we have the very gift of eternal life right in our presence. And why isn't the world clamoring, banging on our doors to come and receive this very gift? They only knew and believed. And yet, sadly, even within the church, there are many who call themselves believers, who ignore this very gift of God and attempt to get on with their lives without it. But the Lord is still here, even if they're not giving out this wonderful gift to you week after week, desiring to fill your lives with his love by giving us his son who died and rose again for you. Yes, life is hard, but Jesus is here for you. Believe it. For Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and protect your heart and mind in true faith, the life of everlasting. Amen. I invite you now to please rise and join with me as we sing together the words of the author.
Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We especially remember in our prayers this morning Bonnie's niece, Diana, who when she was undergoing surgery earlier this week was found to have cancer. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as you provided for the Israelites during their journey through the wilderness to the land you had promised, give us confidence to trust in your promises and to look to your hand to provide all we need for this life and for the life to come. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Master of the vineyard, sustain those who send you, who you send into your harvest. Give your blessing to pastors teachers, Christian leaders, and all who abide in your word, that they would be enabled to work diligently and faithfully for your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our Lord. prayer. God and Father of all, enable us to walk in humility, gentleness, and patience, that we would bear with one another in love, and be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father, we give thanks that you have provided us with earthly families, for mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers. But you have also made us brothers and sisters in Christ, members all in the body with unique gifts. Continue to bless Good Shepherd and all her members, especially Laurel, Susan, Lori, Doug and Jackie, and Walter and Debbie. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Lord of all, hear our prayers for the hungry and the homeless. Provide for them not only bread to satisfy their hunger, but above all the true bread of life, Jesus Christ, who alone can fill and satisfy every need of body and soul. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Show your mercy to the sick and hospitalized, including Diana, Lori, Karen, Hilda, Tammy, Jennifer, Lillian, Joanne, Vicki, Peggy, Jackie, Larry, Jeff, Richard, and Vic. Provide doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals to care for those who need help and healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, sustain the proper use of the sacraments among us, that your church would continue to be blessed with your gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation, through the waters of holy baptism, and through the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
good right in salutary, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
body of Christ, given freely.
Please rise. This true body and this true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve your body and soul in the true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace and joy. Your sins are forgiven. Amen.
You may be seated. There's a couple of things to bring to your attention. Of course, you're always invited to come and join us for Bible class. Um, we're still making our way through the end of Timoth or St. Paul's first letter to Timothy. We're in the sixth chapter. Um, last week we started talking about money and stuff, which actually fit in really well with this morning's sermon. Uh, but if you would like to come and join us as well, please do. Uh, and on Thursdays we continue to make our way through the book of Micah. Uh, it's actually really convenient because this last week we went off total course and ended up spending time talking about the last day and the resurrection of the dead and all sorts of other, those other wonderful things that are still to come. So if you're like, oh my goodness, I missed that part on Matthew or Micah chapter 5 verse 3 where Micah writes about Bethlehem and Ephrathah and the coming of the king. Well, that's great, because you didn't actually miss anything this last week. So I expect to see you there this coming Thursday at noon for your lunch, if you would like, or snacks or whatever, popcorn, whatever really floats your boat, you can come and join us for that as well. Also, a reminder, um, our upcoming church picnic, picnic here in August, which is going to be at Brandenburg Park, um, I think it starts... Cooking's going to start at 5.30-ish, somewhere around there, and we're going to gather together to start eating, I think, about 6 o'clock. If you would like to bring a, um, another dish or dessert or something along to share with everybody else, that would be great. Um, so make sure that that gets on the calendar, which also means that we won't be having elders meeting that night. Oh, darn. <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll take August off. We'll see. <laughs> Depends on how much business we have to cover. I don't hear any, you know, noise from either of the two elders who are here, so maybe we'll just do that very thing this year. Anyways, we'll see. Anything else? Okay. Christ is risen! He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.